everyone. Welcome to this month's In Focus talk. The, uh, we're covering tonight the six of, our, of seven of our areas of focus, maternal and child health. And uh, I'll be pleased to ask Gwenda Griffiths to introduce our speaker in a few minutes or in a, in, in a very short while. Um, what I will say is that uh, these monthly meetings happen um, on the second Thursday every month. And um, I'll tell you about the one for May at the end of this meeting. During the meeting, if you're wishing to ask any questions about, uh, or any questions for Charles to, to answer after his talk, please put them in the Q&A. You'll find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be happy to collate those and uh, ask Charles to answer them after his talk. So without any further waiting, I'd like to pass over to Gwenda to introduce our speaker. Wendy Griffiths. Thank you, John. Um, good evening, everybody. This evening, we welcome Charles Cox um, to look at closer at child and maternal health. Charles is a retired obstetrician and gynecologist who has been supporting mothers and children around the world for over five decades. Charles has served in the Royal Army Medical Corps for 45 years and during that time has worked across the UK and around the world, including posts in the Falkland Islands and military deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Charles has been on 12 obstetric, obst the word now, obstetric and gynecological visits to Baghdad and Basra, and has assisted maternity facilities in the Punjab Valley, northeastern Afghanistan. And he's also visited Africa, the Middle East and the Caribbean on teaching trips including Haiti during after the, um, the, the volcano, sorry, after being hit by the hurricane. Charles is a member of the city of Wolverhampton Rotary, and he is a proud member of Rotary Calmed, which is an acronym for Collaboration, Collaborative Action in Lowering of Maternal Encounter Deaths. And he has been involved in assessing maternal projects in Uganda, Nigeria and Kenya for Rotary. Charles is joining us this evening from his family holiday in Abu Dhabi. So we welcome him to our evening focus tonight. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll just clarify, it's Abu Dhabi, not Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm not that uh, well off. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak to you tonight. I'll be speaking really um, about my experiences um, I've also done a bit of research. I've watched uh, This May Hurt, which is the program about obstetrics on uh, the BBC, and also the Panorama program talking about uh, what happened in the adjacent trust to me, which is Shrewsbury and Telford. I also spent uh, three hours yesterday afternoon with a last minute panic um, bit of research. I listened to Shekhar Mehta, for being interviewed for an hour, which was uh, very interesting. And as you know, his remit was empowering women. And we'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. And then we had two hours where we had a talk from the uh, uh, representative of the World Health Organization, which was full of wonderful um, targets. Uh, targets are wonderful things. Um, I always remember the story about targets. What you do is you fire your gun and then you go out and on the barn you draw a target around uh, where you've just shot. I don't think it's the same for that in uh, Rotary. I have the next slide please. Thank you. Um, so have we actually made um, much in the way of progress in empowering women? When we look at what's happened recently in Afghanistan, uh, I think the answer must be not really. And in Pakistan, the neighboring uh, country, honor killings are still uh, a part of life or death. Uh, protecting women in conflict, the first casualties of, uh, of uh, conflict are women and children unsurprisingly. And even in our own country, we find that small groups of very motivated people can actually make 
big differences, not always for the best. And uh, perhaps I might be thinking about the business about trans activists reducing the role of women and also uh, Extinction Rebellion, I, I suppose we could allow them to glue themselves to whatever they want. I mention this because in 1993 there was a, a movement called Changing Childbirth, which was done with all the very best intentions in the world, um, supported by a very vocal group of activist midwives, Association of Radical Midwives, and again supported by the Bien Pensant movement of North London and uh, the politicians, and particularly uh, Baroness Cumberledge with one of her reports. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now the next slide, please. So really, actually, are we putting women and children first? It's the top of the list, well, top or fifth actually in the WHO, I think, isn't it? But uh, we should be judged by our actions rather than what we say. We'll have the next slide, please. We've always known uh, historically that uh, childbirth is dangerous. And certainly the Bishop of Exeter uh, can see that pretty obviously. Yeah. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, girls, just a bit about me, because, you know, I'm very fond of me. Uh, I've retired some time ago uh, from Wolverhampton. Uh, I had an interesting retirement because the month after I retired, I spent a month in a field hospital just outside Mosul. This was in 2017, so it was really at a time when Mosul was being uh, liberated. So that was quite an interesting time. Um, I was luck lucky enough, I think lucky is probably the word, to deploy to Iraq in the actual invasion of Iraq or liberation, whichever, if you depending whether you're British or American. Um, <clears throat> we were driven up there in, uh, in literally in buses. Um, this was on the second day of the invasion and really does uh, point out the lack of preparation that we had made for this particular uh, adventure and is only exceeded by the lack of preparation for what happened after the, uh, the immediate conflict was over. I've been very lucky to uh, spend time in Liberia, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, um, Kenya, Uganda, uh, and have had some wonderful times and been looked after and had wonderful um, fellowship. Um, my overseas experience has been mainly, I think, in Iraq. I've been there on 14 occasions, if we account the times that were spent in Kurdistan. Um, and found a wonderful bunch of doctors there struggling under the most dreadful conditions, uh, certainly immediately after the, uh, the conflict. Uh, and unfortunately, the hospitals, the best hospitals, were being suffering terribly from uh, corruption and uh, people taking equipment away. The high spot of my rotary career so far has certainly been going to Uganda, which was a physical visit. And uh, I was honored to be introduced to uh, a rotary royalty, which is uh, Tusu to Severa, who looked after me amazingly well. The next two visits were to Nigeria, which were virtual, and it was interesting uh, examining people using WhatsApp. And the other, uh, the other one was to Kenya, and again, meeting people and being shown a tour of uh, the hospital by WhatsApp. I've been very fortunate in being an examiner for the Diploma in the Medical Management of Catastrophes, which is a diploma uh, which is um, put out by the Society of Apothecaries in London and is a diploma which is expected that the uh, 
people going into the medical corps in the uh, military are expected to complete. Also, I've been the director of the Baby Lifeline Training Company and a founder member of the charity which started in 1981. And this again is to do with um, saving babies' lives. The woman who founded this had lost three babies at around 26, 27, 28 weeks in uh, the days when babies that size didn't survive. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, conflicts of interest, well, I'm still a member of uh, Baby Lifeline. I don't think that's a particular uh, problem. Baby Lifeline has uh, organized conferences in Kuwait. That was immediately after the liberation of Kuwait and also uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the president of the charity is someone called Donna Oppenden, who so I suspect that most of you will have heard of because she's just produced the really quite, awful, well, the report is excellent, but uh, the awful happenings at uh, Shrewsbury and Telford. I also do used to do some medical legal work, which gives you and gives me an insight into uh, things that happened, and there have been cases uh, in neighbouring trusts which I have given opinions on. I did forty five years in the military reserve, had a wonderful time, and they were very decent to me. When I say I'm a father of four vaginal deliveries, this is to uh, make the point that I've got nothing against normal birth or natural birth. And I, I assume I'm the father because it's a wise child who knows his own father, obviously. Um, and I'm very, very honored to have five grandchildren, two delivered by a cesarean section as a, in the breech position, having been conserved, conceived with in vitro fertilization, which I think is standard practice in all hospitals now. And my others have del delivered uh, vaginally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I mean, the other thing, conflict of interest, possibly I should mention is that Wolverhampton is next door to Shrewsbury. Uh, I was chair of the Higher Training Committee, which is looking after the trainees in obstetrics and gynaecology in the 90s. And uh, I've been teaching on childbirth emergencies in the community for Baby Lifeline for some time. All around the world, uh, the, uh, we've looked at uh, what actually happens with natural childbirth. Uh, and in Somalia, to be pregnant is to have one foot in the grave. And the other from Africa is the grave of a pregnant woman is dug for 40 days, which fits very well indeed, actually, with the churching of women, which used to happen in our, uh, uh, certainly the Church of England and other denominations until comparatively recently. And this was uh, to welcome the new child, well, it was to actually confirm that the mother had survived, whether the baby had survived or not. But on a good day, that would be, the baby would be delivered, uh, or also sometimes for adoption as well, they had these services. And it was, it starts, it was to thanks for the safe deliverance and preservation from the great dangers of childbirth. So we look at some of the dangers of childbirth. You have the next slide, please. Basically just making the same point, I think. This woman almost certainly died of uh, postpartum hemorrhage, which probably worldwide uh, kills about a quarter of the women who die of after childbirth and is a particular problem which 80 in 80% 80 of cases can be dealt with not by wonderful doctors, but by trained midwives. Next slide, please. Uh, it's still a man's world, I'm grateful for that, obviously. But uh, when we talk about women and children first, this isn't, uh, this isn't happening at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Let's just have a think about this. So in 1900, the death rate was uh, 450 mothers per 100,000. 
And I'm sure people have walked around the, uh, the graveyards uh, in our local churches and seen so many young mothers who've died and also of a colossal number of young children who've died. So we're down to seven per 100,000 now, which is pretty good. Uh, it's not getting any better. Partly people are delaying having children. There is a problem with obesity and uh, with encouraging uh, uh, people coming from abroad. I think uh, at least 25%, I think, of babies that are born are born to mothers who are born elsewhere. That doesn't mean to say they're any less deserving, but it may be that they haven't had the advantages uh, of physical advantages of being brought up in uh, the UK. At the moment, um, in Sierra Leone, certainly a few years ago, the death rate was 900 per 100,000, which is the highest for any country in the UK. In Sweden, um, in 1860, uh, 900 per 100,000 was the number of uh, women who died. And they had quite a smart idea, really, that if they actually trained midwives to look after women, uh, and they got up to 80% of uh, women were attended by a wife. The actual death rate from uh, uh, maternity halved. So it went down to, uh, I can't remember exactly, sorry. In Kabul, I, I've been fortunate enough to go to Afghanistan three times. First one was with uh, uh, some Americans to have a look at uh, doing some training there, which I think would have been difficult. Um, the second time was uh, with the military um, to Camp Bastion, where, as I'm sure you can imagine, we saw some fairly dreadful injuries, both to our own soldiers, but also as collateral damage to other local people who were there. Um, the Hindu Kush, uh, which is that beautiful area um, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, the death rate is 600,000 per 100,000. The reason, some of the reasons for that is that the women become pregnant at a very, very early age. Um, they are covered with clothes, uh, which, you know, rather more than most of us, so that they tend to get rickets. And they are so far away from medical support that uh, there's no way that they're going to get uh, some medical help. Um, I think it's uh, down to one in 15 women in sub-Saharan Africa will now die of childbirth complications, so things have minimally improved. The next slide, please. Um, four horsemen of the apocalypse, as far as obstetrics is concerned. Next slide, please. Okay, unsafe abortion, that happens in all uh, countries, whether abortion is legal or illegal, although, of course, it occurs predominantly in uh, countries where abortion is illegal. Hypertensive disorders which have been reduced significantly by obstetric care um, and hemorrhage, which occurs, which accounts for about a quarter of deaths and 80% of which can be sorted out by fairly simple manoeuvres. The story of sepsis is interesting because back in 1790, um, Alexander Gordon, who was a ship surgeon in between trips, uh, went to a maternity hospital and there was an epidemic of childbirth fever, 77 women died. And what he writes is, it's a disagreeable, disagreeable fact that I myself was the means of carrying the infection to a great number of women. The other big name to do with this, who uh, was denounced and, uh, by his seniors, was Semmelweis, in, uh, who actually ended up in a lunatic asylum. Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a doctor but not a uh, obstetrician, said, I carried the disease from patient to patient 
with physicians and nurses. Next slide, please. Of course, if um, a woman dies in childbirth, it's likely she has other children. And uh, if she has other children, they are at much greater risk of dying. Uh, you lose your father, it's not a big deal particularly. Um, but you lose your mother and your chances of dying are very high. Stillbirths now in this country, 3.8 per, per thousand, but that equals 2,346. It's been worked out that if people were delivered at 37 weeks rather than 41 weeks, that would save 650 births a year. We're not allowed to say that because that's uh, that'd be interfering with nature. Next slide, please. Changing childbirth 1993, uh, quite rightly, this was a react reaction against the medicalization of birth. When I first started, a woman would sign a form to say that uh, we could do anything we wanted to her, and she'd consented to that. Uh, birth is natural, and uh, at that time it was a male-dominated profession. This is not the case at the moment, as you probably know. Leave it to the midwives, uh, some of whom designated themselves as the, uh, the musketeers. Uh, they were doing terrible things to women in those days, giving them, shaving them and giving them enemas. Before, well, before they uh, got established in labour. Go to the next slide, please. This is a cartoon from uh, Private Eye, surprisingly enough. Um, and it reminds me of the great comedian Jeremy Hardy's comment about uh, home birth was that the great thing about home birth is you don't miss any television. Next slide, please. So anyone got, got any idea what's wrong with this advice really? This is looking entirely at process. I think most people who are hoping to go through childbirth are hoping to come out alive and also very much hoping that their baby will come out alive and undamaged. Next slide please. So then we move on to uh, the report on Morecambe Bay and then more subsequently the report on Shrewsbury and Telford which was a pride in low cesarean section rate so this was the thing there was a big thing I think this was from WHO as well to reduce the cesarean section rate but unfortunately they didn't look at the actual outcome which is the perinatal mortality rate and also the rate of damage to babies and quite rightly the midwives wanted to be nice and protect the doctors, but protect the women from doctors who might be doing unnecessary interventions to them. The trouble is you never know whether an intervention is uh, unnecessary until afterwards. And again, as you probably know, there's been a tremendous amount of covering up. Next slide, please. Okay, what's the natural birth? Vaginal birth, no intervention, letting nature take its course. And uh, Shrewsbury is a very nice town. It's very, very popular with people who want to practice there. So it attracts a very, very high standard of doctor and consultant. Uh, person who was a friend, I mean, and I knew him very well because he was very important in the politics of uh, our college. He said in 2002 to the Health Select Committee, we have low intervention rates and one that it, once that is known, we attract both midwives and obstetricians who like to practice in this way. So that really is the start of uh, uh, where you get the uh, unexpected consequences of your decisions. Go to the next slide, please. I'm sure people may remember the triple obstetric tragedy, which was a natural birth. Um, 
Sir Richard Crofts, who was the obstetrician, restricted her diet, bled her during the pregnancy. The first stage lasted 26 hours, second stage 24 hours. She was delivered of a stillborn nine pound infant and five hours later she died. Her pregnancy went to 42 weeks, uh, obviously increases the chance of stillbirth. Um, Sir Richard didn't take this very well and on the 13th of February uh, in the, the following year in February he shot himself. Uh, he was found with Shakespeare's Love's Labour Lost open uh, at the quote, Fair Sir, God save you, where is the princess? Now it would be sad if things like this still occurred. Um, there's a woman, there's a, a midwife who was at an inquest. The woman died because uh, a large piece of placenta was left inside and the midwife, who was a private midwife, failed to return when things were not going well. But her closing remark to her, to the husband was Claire had a great pregnancy. She had a really lovely spontaneous birth at home and I hope that Simon in time will remember that. Now <clears throat> the great thing at the moment is consent and there's a big, a big case which some of you may have been aware of which is Montgomery versus Lanarkshire Health Authority. This is a woman who uh, was just, just five foot tall. Her sister and mother were both doctors. She had done a science degree at uh, Glasgow and she worked in uh, uh, hospitals quite a lot. She had diabetes, which means that's a high risk pregnancy and babies get bigger and they're more at risk of a condition called shoulder dystocia. The person who was managing the pregnancy uh, decided that she shouldn't be told about risks of shoulder dystocia and the risks of the baby's death, fracture of the arm, damage to the uh, nerves, or the risk of cerebral palsy. And of course, what happened was that she did develop all those complications and before that she had uh, uh, in the antenatal counselling, these have never been mentioned. So that's really turned things on its head. Next slide, please. Um, I'd, I'd, just to make the point really that uh, actually having doctors around is quite good uh, and having midwives around is even more important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, they think it's all over. Well, it will be soon. Um, <clears throat> always remember a couple of, meeting a couple of midwives who brought somebody in from her home delivery. It had been a wonderful home delivery. She delivered normally. The baby was fine. Uh, they were just getting the champagne out of the fridge and she had a massive postpartum hemorrhage and she was brought into hospital. Um, you know, I was talking to the midwives and said, look, you know, these, these things happen, it can't be helped. And they said, well, I'm never ever going to do a home delivery again, you know. Um, next slide, please. Now, better off dead, this is really is the elephant in the room. And those people who watched the uh, Panorama programme may remember the woman who developed a very serious obstetric complication of birth, which is a fourth degree tear which occurs actually to 4% of women having their first baby. 40% of women being delivered will either end up with a caesarean section or a forceps delivery or von two's delivery. And very often they're not told this. In 1997, a study was done of female obstetricians uh, where 31% of them said they would opt for a caesarean section. So who do you go to for the insider uh, information. I would have thought the female obstetrician. Next slide, please. Obstetric fistula, a terrible uh, holocaust around the around the world. This is, um, but to a lesser degree, there's the problems of prolapse, 
particularly urinary incontinence. And uh, I'm sure you all remember the uh, Les, Les Dawson, the great pianist, used to say, laugh, there wasn't a dry seat in the house. So we've always known about these problems. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Um, first casualty of any uh, of any action is the women and children. We're seeing this, I think, uh, particularly in Ukraine at the moment, where maternal hosp maternity hospitals have been bombed. Um, again, there's the same old problems of actually failing to realise there is a problem in the first place. There's difficulty travelling to medical facilities often and difficulties uh, once you get there of finding if there's a doctor there and whether actually there's anything that they know that can be done. Next slide, please. Uh, we know why women are vulnerable. Uh, social status, and this obviously is maybe cultural and to an extent uh, reflects uh, religious values. Um, women and children are the, prob uh, the problem. 20% of reproductive age and one in five would be pregnant. Uh, also, as we're seeing, I think, from Ukraine, there's reports of rapes and uh, gender-based violence. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I, I can't, couldn't resist putting this in. This is when I was in uh, Kurdistan near Mosul. Uh, this is a woman who came in, well, it's not a woman, that's a baby. A woman came in having been shot in the abdomen uh, around term and she was contracting in labour. Fetal heart was present. Uh, she was taken to theatre and a laparotomy was carried out. Um, there had been a chunk of the uterus had been taken out. The bullet had uh, taken a chunk out of the uterus and the baby had stuck his elbow in the hole or had been obviously got there. Uh, he was absolutely fine and there wasn't any particular damage to his elbow. The rest of her abdomen was perfectly normal. Um, so she was lucky. Um, Two days later, she was going home and we were told by the Iraqi doctor who worked with us that if she didn't go home immediately, her husband would move off and find himself another wife. I don't know whether that was true, but he didn't seem to be joking. Next slide, please. Another child, uh, collateral damage for catastrophes. Next slide, please. I'm sure that if you look carefully at this, you have no, you, no doubt about what is about to be performed on some young female child. I won't show you the rest of the photos because they're just appalling. Next slide, please. That's female genital mutilation, of course. Um, I've been very lucky with Rotary. Um, as I said before, Rotary does a lot of work and things that we can do to help, I think, are supporting uh, small projects. Uh, there is an enormous one in uh, Nigeria to reduce the uh, uh, number of uh, pregnancies that are going on, which is somewhat unsuccessful. Africa is the only part of the world where uh, population is rising. Um, <clears throat> Kenya was a very, very pleasant. Again, this was done uh, basically via WhatsApp. Um, and this was a refurbishment uh, or building of a cesarean section theatre. Um, have a next slide, please. What's the, what's the take home message really? I think we all say that uh, maternal and child health is the most important thing. Are we actually moving very fast in that direction? Well, I don't think we are really. Um, we are afraid sometimes of uh, confronting cultural uh, issues. 
but from the point of view of survival, the basic functions don't need hospitals or doctors, midwives to give, to do antenatal care and to be present at delivery uh, can reduce, it's reckoned, 80% of maternal deaths. Next slide, please. I couldn't resist putting in uh, the picture of Tusu Tusubira, Francis Tusubira, who was the most charming host uh, when I was in Uganda. Um, and people love their rotary in Uganda. People, young people, when I say young, uh, even younger than me, uh, people of in their twenties are going to two or three rotary meetings a week, a great social uh, event. Now the next slide, please. Uh, I couldn't resist putting this picture in. Um, you notice that I'm standing in front of the, in, behind the sign, which is giving, offering safe male circumcision. I won't go into my present status at the moment, but enough to say that uh, uh, someone had beaten them to it, I think. Um, wonderful people, um, just so friendly and working really hard against uh, difficult situations. I remember going to one of the um, uh, outposts where they deliver babies. If they have a massive epileptic hemorrhage or a problem, the only way to get to another hospital, to get to a hospital was by motorbike. So you would have someone who was very ill uh, on the back of a motorbike with a midwife uh, or helper uh, behind her to stop her falling off. And I said, do, do, do they sometimes die? And she said, yes. Mm. So it's a different, uh, a different world. Next slide, please. As I was saying, I had the most wonderful uh, hospitality and fellowship when I was in Uganda. These are Tusu's uh, grandchildren. And I think the cheeky one with all the teeth came up to me and said, why is your skin so white? Which upset Tusu. I don't see why it should really. But I have to say that in Wolverhampton, we weren't blessed with the same amount of sun. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, as you realize, I really do not have many answers to the problems which have been thrown up, but I do think that uh, small efforts and uh, personal contacts with groups abroad is the way forward. There are some enormous rotary projects, obviously, and they should be supported, but uh, local Rotary clubs supporting local Rotary clubs abroad seems a very good way forward. Um, and again, from the point of view of um, <clears throat> improving, uh, empowering women, education, education, education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. That most enlightening, excellent presentation with some real hard hitting facts. Um, if any of you here have any questions, please, can you put them in the Q&A box and we will come to those in a minute. Some of you have already um, sent in some questions. The first question to Charles comes from uh, Maya Williams, uh, Rotary Club of Swansea. How can we prevent maternal and neonatal deaths in worn, torn countries? Well, I think the answer is I, I wish I knew. Um, I think better coordination probably um, with the NGOs is helpful. Um, it's not just um, war-torn countries. I mean, what happened in Haiti, as probably most people know, uh, showed NGOs up in an extremely bad, bad light, uh, especially on the obstetric uh, side. People went in and basically, uh, for a short while, worked hard, destroyed a lot of the in local infrastructure, and then left, having the tick in their box for the, the CVs in the long term. Um, in the military, we, we used to have uh, 
in the medical side, uh, a field hospital which would go out to support um, tragedies abroad. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think there is an easy answer. And it is the first casualty of anything is uh, the care of mothers and children. Um, basically, what you need is midwives. Trained midwives are the, uh, are the answer. And certainly in Uganda, the project that I looked at there was a lot a long going project in training midwives. So you need to get the midwives out into the, uh, the conflict areas. So the short answer is I don't know. Thank you, Charles, for your honesty. Our next question is from Janine um, Bertwistle of the Rotary Club of Guernsey. How do you see the Empowering Girls Initiative introduced by RI President Sheckel tying in with this area of focus? Um, well, I think, um, as I said, I did actually spend an hour listening to uh, uh, Sheikh Ameta being interviewed, and it was a very impressive man. The thing I came away from with that, that basically, I think, as we all know, a lot of it comes down to education. If you can educate the women, then they become more powerful. Um, I mean, there are some parts of the world where it's going to be difficult to do that. Um, he was suggesting, I think, um, supporting scholarships for girls. Um, I suppose small rotary clubs could do that in particular, in particular areas. I mean, I, I think really uh, from the point of view of empowering women, we've actually either stayed still or gone back over the last uh, 12 months, unfortunately, internationally. I think we've just got to keep trying, haven't we? Thank you, Charles. Again, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Our next question is from Mike Sw Smith um, from the Rotary Club of, I don't know, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly. Sorry, Mike. Abenoin and Apple, Upper D side. How has your military experience, especially BATLS, given you the opportunity to spread the life saving techniques taught on the BATLS course abroad? Um, if that's the mic, I think it might be. Um, how do we... The parallels between um, injuries to young fit men and obstetrics are quite close because both people start with quite a reserve um, the physiological reserve. Um, the lessons learned from the bat battlefields of Iraq and particularly uh, Afghanistan um, have been translated uh, into obstetric uh, management now. So it, it has made a big difference. The resuscitation uh, methods um, which were pioneered in uh, the military, have gone on to save women's lives in obstetrics. So the basic principles of uh, battles is uh, control severe hemorrhage, and that, that is the bottom line. And Thank you. obviously you need to manage people properly after this. <laughs> but yes, it, some, some good has come out of the tragedies uh, of uh, Afghanistan. Thank you, Charles. Our next question is from Mam Gay Dop of the Rotary Club of Pre Prestatim. How many more countries are you planning to help and support in Africa? Um, I think I'm, I probably have to play the age card here because I am uh, very old really. Um, I would love to go abroad again. I think there's an important uh, 
factor is uh, credibility. And I think it's important that uh, if you are going to go abroad and tell people what you think they should be doing, that you are actually uh, active in that specialty. I know not everyone would agree, but I think that's uh, it's important. So I'm very happy to go and assess things, which I suppose is slightly, I think is slightly different rather than, uh, than to actually physically carry out any particular operative procedures. I'm 75, it's fun. Very lucky to have got this far. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Our next question is from Rufus Ozahu of the Northwick Park Rotary Club in Harrow. Please advise how I could be involved with helping out in maternal and child health programs in Africa, especially Nigeria. Okay. Um, if he gives me a, uh, an email, I'll put you in touch with Adi Mataloku from. Uh, I never remember whether she's from Nottingham or Leicester, but she's organised um, obstetric emergency courses in Nigeria, uh, which I was very, very fortunate to be a part of um, two or three years ago. And again, uh, the hospitality and the way we looked after was uh, fantastic. We were in Lagos, which is uh, a bit of a one-off as a city, I think. So, yeah, I'll be very happy to put you, put you in touch with her. Do you want Rufus to put his email address in the chat or will you, which way around you're going to communicate? Would he mind awfully um, emailing me? That'd be all right. And then I'll, I'll have his email. Yeah. OK. That's probably the safest way to do it from my point of view. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Ronald Proudfoot of the Retro Club of Whitehaven. What gives you the most hope for the future? Well, I think things are going to get better globally. <laughs> um, steps certainly have been made in reducing um, maternal deaths and also reducing child mortality and morbidity. Um, but certainly for Africa, the, I say not, maybe it isn't a problem, but uh, there's the increasing uh, population there does seem to present certain challenges, especially in places like Nigeria, which I think is reckoned to double its population in the next 30 years. I think organizations like Rotary, if you look back at the history of uh, what's happened with um, polio, I think if we did actually turn the main focus towards maternal and child health, that would almost certainly make a difference. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm now going to hand you back to John, who's going to answer, I was going to put questions to Charles that have been put in the Q&A box. I can see there's a number of people that put things in chat. If they really want them in the Q&A box, please, can they put them into there? Thank you. Thank you, Gwenda. We've had quite a few questions, and I don't think we're going to have time to get through all of them in detail. But I'll try and block them into sort of summarised groups. Um, there's there's a, a, a number of questions about um, refugees and, and war-torn areas, Charles. And clearly, we're all aware that most of the uh, refugees who are fleeing, particularly Ukraine at the moment, but elsewhere around the world, are, uh, are women and children. Um, do you have particular concerns about their plight and, and how we might alleviate that? I think we might make it slightly easier for them to get into the UK, I think, to start. I think that's been a, you know, a source of great embarrassment and shame, actually, what's happened there. Um, and um, certainly our Rotary Club in Wolverhampton is expecting some uh, uh, refugees. Of course, we've got, a, I suppose, a, a small share of refugees from Afghanistan as well. So I think it all, um, I, I understand Nicola Sturgeon's very keen to have lots, isn't she? So 
sure she'll be dipping her hand in her pocket there. But yeah. uh, no, I, I think compared to other countries, we really haven't been pulling our weight. Uh, I don't know what we do about that. I know that Rotary is pr providing equipment to uh, uh, Ukraine and the environs, and certainly the charity I've been involved with for a long time has certainly taken out maternity bags to uh, Ukraine to be used um, to try and help a little bit. Yeah. No, that's good to know. Thank you. Because clearly, I mean, we've all heard the odd story or occasional stories of uh, these women who are well into labour, let's say, when they're having to flee. And it's, uh, no, absolutely. I, I, I just can't imagine how terrible it must be. Um, yeah. Fine, thank you. Um, slightly more general questions. Is the attitude of male-dominated societies, is it, the, is it the attitude of male-dominated societies that is the real obstacle of, to the health of women and children? And uh, have you got any thoughts as to how Rotary might get involved with getting that changed? Challenging questions, these ones, Charles, I know. I wish there was an easy answer to any of them. Um, Yes, I mean, I've, I've used to teach on a course to medical students about uh, uh, catastrophe and conflict. And it always came up, you know, that we would have a lecture on um, gender equality. And it, it's all fine. I mean, the impo first important step is to actually make sure that women and their children survive. Um, certainly education has really got to be the next big thing, hasn't it? Um, how are you going to change entrenched uh, views? I don't know. I, in the introduction, it was mentioned that I'd been in the Panjshir Valley um, in Afghanistan, and uh, this was to do with providing birthing facilities for women. They used to build the uh, birthing huts well away from the men because uh, they didn't want the men disturbed by the noises of women giving birth. Mm. When I was in, uh, I'm turning into a when I, we call that in the army a when I, you know, when I did this, when I did that. Uh, but when I was in um, Camp Bastion, there was a little girl there who'd been, who'd been blown up. She was about seven or eight. She'd lost an arm, had a lot of abdominal injuries, but, she did very, very well and very cheerful at soul. The only time I saw her cry was when she was given medicine for worms. Um, but uh, her father, uh, it was his third wife and she was 13 when she gave birth to Rahima. So Rahima did very well I mean, with her one arm and she lost her finger off her other hand that she was going back to uh, a situation where she was, I've got a horrible feeling, considered to be not very valuable. Mm. Uh, we didn't have any women of uh, childbearing age. The oldest, uh, well, we did, we did have one woman, I think, who was about 80, who got locked down by a, a vehicle just near the camp. But uh, nobody else apart from children of female sex, because, um, you know, we prefer that the woman dies, you know, we prefer that they die than be looked after by uh, a slot. Uh, but, you know, this is hundreds of years of, uh, of a culture which is different to ours. Just to finalise, oh, yeah. Charles, just as a last point, could mm. you just highlight the, the single most effective project that you've been aware of, of Rotarians being involved in, where Rotarians have taken some action in this field and where you feel it's been particularly effective? I think that the most ambitious project and the one which uh, probably would have the most effect would be the family planning project in uh, Nigeria. And that's an enormous project and that is to combat the enormous growth of, uh, of numbers. Not, not the most, you know, exciting one maybe, 
that uh, it's difficult, you know. I mean, uh, for men, having several children is uh, a sign of virility, I think, isn't it? So is that back to back to your point about education? I would think. Isn't yes. It? Yes. Yeah. Well, and of course, you've got to have a situation where where you do have children. The ones you do have are likely to survive. Yeah. Because I mean, looking back at some of the uh, the composers and uh, people in the middle, you know, they they talk about on Radio Three, you know, so they would have sort of seven or eight children, two or three who survived. Yeah. You know, it's uh, dreadful. So we've we've moved on a bit, but uh, probably for a lot of parts of the world, we haven't moved on quite far enough. I know there are still parts of the world where uh, female infanticide is carried out, isn't it? You know, women, uh, little girls aren't aren't valued. Yes, I'm afraid that is the case, Charles. I'm going to uh, bring things to a close there, Charles, and thank you enormously for your, your talk. Uh, the, it's a field where clearly you've illustrated a, a wide range of, of problems, um, both medical, but also societal and attitudinal. And uh, as I said earlier in one of my questions, they're not easy questions to answer. Mm. And uh, I think Rotary will do everything it can to alleviate the poverty in the education, as well as the, sim as the straightforward medical intervention to, uh, to help with some of the things you've illustrated tonight. So, so thank you very much for that. And um, we would uh, just like to wish you well in future um, activities you have in this field. So thank you again, Charles. Thank you very much. At next month's In Focus talk, we'll feature supporting our own charity, the Rotary Foundation. On the 12th of May, our speaker will be Espen Malmberg. Espen is the Foundation Services Manager at the Rotary International Europe and Africa office in Zurich. He's responsible for overseeing all the grant and fund development and recognition related activities for Europe, Africa and the Middle East. He's a major supporter for our Rotary Foundation leaders here in Great Britain and Ireland. He collaborates particularly with the Rotary Foundation coordinators and our endowment and major gift advisors to increase Rotarian engagement and support for the Foundation. We look forward to hearing from Espen then, so join us at 5pm on Thursday the 12th of May. I wish you all a good evening.